One of the compelling pieces of evidence for God is the universe itself. Does the universe look designed? Does it look like a mess? Does it look purposeful? Does it look not purposeful? What are the attributes of the universe that would suggest that the, the universe had an intelligent source and an intelligent cause? So I guess the first question would be, if you were to look at any object, um, what would cause you to conclude that it was designed, constructed, and had a purpose? So I came up with a quick little list. So, and this is not scientific, these are just my observations. Uh, but, but I would look at its organization. I would look at its components. Are those components standardized? Or are they random? I would look at what's driving it. Is it a simple force? Is it complex force? I would look at its construction. Does it look like it was constructed by someone or does it look like it was just randomly hobbled together? I would also look at the way it operates. I would look at whether it appears to be fine tuned or whether it doesn't have a level of precision. I would look at intelligibility. I mean, can you understand it? I would look at beauty. I would look at complexity. I would look at progression. And does it appear to have a purpose? So if we were to use these simple measures and take a look at our universe, what would it show? Well, one of the things it would not show, and I find this very interesting, and this is if you look at the universe at the highest level from the big picture, the first thing it doesn't show is a mess. And that's pretty significant. And this is what Paul Davies, an Arizona State professor, had to say. He said, instead of finding space is filled with the dog's breakfast of unrelated bric-a-brac, astronomers see an orchestrated and coherent unity. On the largest scale of size, there's order and uniformity. And that's pretty significant. But not only does the universe not appear to be a random dog's breakfast mess of things, the universe also appears to demonstrate architecture. And this is from physicist Freeman Dyson. He says, I don't claim that the architecture of the universe proves the existence of God. I, I claim only that the architecture of the universe is consistent with the hypothesis that mind plays an essential role in its functioning. So these two physicists have some very interesting observations. At the biggest scale of things, the universe appears to be orchestrated, purposeful, and architected. But what about the smallest scale of things? If the universe was designed, constructed, and has a purpose, you should see that not just at the biggest level, but you would think you would see it at the smallest level. So let's take a look. Let's take a look at the atom. Now, if you're like me, a lot of you uh, got through chemistry class and you listened uh, and you remembered very little. So, so some of this is going to be a refresher in the things you were supposed to have learned a long, long time ago. Um, but at the, at the bottom line is, is this, when you look at an atom, it actually does have the characteristics of something that was designed, something that was constructed and is purposeful. So let's take a look at its standard components. Um, Atoms operate in an environment of four fundamental forces. Electromagnetic force, strong nuclear force, weak nu nuclear force, and gravity. That's not particularly simple. There's 17 fundamental particles in, in an atom if you are not including antiparticles. That's pretty significant. When you look at these particles, you find what appears to be standard components. So let me give you an example. If you look at the up quark, and for those of you who don't remember, um, every neutron, neutron has two up quarks, and, or pardon me, two down quarks and one up quark, and every proton has two up quarks and one down quark. So this is what you see in an up quark. An up quark has a charge of plus two thirds, a mass of 2.2 mega electron volts over the speed of light squared, wow spin of a half, and a red, green, blue color charge. Wow, that doesn't sound simple. Then you have a down quark with a, with a charge of minus a third, a mass of 4.7 mega electron volts 
uh, over the speed of light squared, a spin of half, and also a red, green, blue color charge. Well, that's pretty interesting. Then you have gluons that hold up quarks and down quarks together to form protons and neutrons. And they have no mass spin or charge, but they do have a color charge. Then you have things like mesons, which are quark and anti-quark pairs that hold the protons and neutrons together. Okay, and then you have what appears to be rules within the atom. So you have what's called the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that, that electrons can't share the same quantum state. And so that's where you have electrons orbiting around the nucleus of an atom um, in different orbitals and shells. And the maximum electrons per shell is two times n squared with n being the, the shell number. Well, that doesn't sound particularly simple to me. It sounds like a lot of standard parts, standard construction, standard components. And all this is held together with, with standard forces. And gee, the universe also demonstrates 26 constants. Now you've heard a lot of them, the speed of light, you know, gravity, those are constants, but there's 26 constants, fundamental constants that they found so far. In addition, you have a lot of precision. So, you know, when you were a kid, you put together the styrofoam balls and the toothpicks and you constructed the atom and, you know, you spray painted it and you won the science club or the science fair prize. You know, all that was very, very exciting. But there's a lot more precision to it than that. Did you know that within the universe itself, at the point of the Big Bang, that they estimate that there was one, there were a billion and one particles of matter for every billion particles of antimatter. And had that number been slightly different, what we see is our universe wouldn't exist. There's about 30 knobs like that. One of them is the cosmological constant. Now, some of you have heard of it. It's basically the rate of it, the expansion of the universe. And it's a big deal number because if the universe were expanding faster than it is, everything would just basically spiral out of control and we wouldn't exist. If it wasn't expanding as fast as it is, it would contract on itself and again, we wouldn't exist. So all of these are really, really big deal things. And you also see progression. You see what appears to be purpose in the universe. And some of you have heard of Penzias and Wilson. So they're the ones who discovered the Big Bang, the background radiation of the Big Bang. And this is what Arno Penzias had to say. He said, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing and delicately balanced to provide exactly the conditions required to support life. In the absence of an absurdly improbable accident, the observations of modern science seem to suggest an underlying, one might say, supernatural plan. So all that's pretty significant. And then I'm gonna throw in two more things to ponder. One is the intelligibility of the universe. And this is what really astounded Einstein. He said that the fact that the, the universe is, is comprehensible is a miracle. And then you have Roger Penrose who, who a uh, brilliant physicist, he said, there's something absolute and God-given about mathematical truth. And I find that also very interesting. But one of the things I find personally incredibly compelling is just the beauty of the universe. And, and you look around and you go, why is everything so beautiful? It didn't have to be beautiful. Why do mountains look beautiful? Sunsets look beautiful, bugs, people. Why does everything look beautiful? It didn't have to be this way. So you have a number of things that, that obviously suggest that the universe has the attributes of design. But I guess the next question is, has the universe always looked this way? Because if the universe developed into this, that would be a totally different story than if the universe has always been this way. And again, this is what Roger Penrose had to say. 
He said, the precision needed to set the universe on its course is seen to be in no way inferior to all that extraordinary precision that we've already become accustomed to. And he's talking about Newton's, Maxwell's, and Einstein's laws, which govern the behavior of things from moment to moment. And then he asked, but why was the Big Bang so precisely organized? And then you have Frank Close, another physicist saying, as the universe aged, it cooled at first very quickly. Within a millionth of a second, quarks clustered together in threes where they have remained ever since. So the significant thing to me is not only does the universe look designed, but according to physicists, there's never been a time where it didn't look designed. So that kind of leads with a couple of options. Either we just randomly happen to exist in a purposeless universe that for absolutely no purpose at all looks incredibly precisely fine-tuned and designed, okay? Or there's some intelligence that designed it. And I tend to think that it is more rational to believe that intelligence is the product of intelligence, that design is the product of a designer, that what we see in the universe is not random, that it's not a mess. So this leads you to a couple of conclusions. And again, Paul Davies, the physicist I quoted from earlier had this to say. He said, I do take life, mind and purpose seriously. And I can see that the universe at least appears to be designed with a high level of ingenuity. I cannot accept these features as a package of marvels that just happen to be, that exist reasonlessly. And then you have Owen Gingrich, a Harvard um, astronomer who made this conclusion. To me, belief in a final cause, a creator God, gives a coherent understanding of why the universe seems so congenially designed for the existence of intelligent, self-reflective life. The universe doesn't look this way for no reason. That's the logical conclusion. At least that's the logical conclusion to me. And that's the logical conclusion that, you know, philosophers and people you see in the Bible have, you know, made for thousands upon thousands of years. The Psalms, which were written about a thousand BC, had this to say. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. And I think that they were right all along.